When I lived in Auckland, I did various dance classes. One of them was called Muscle and Bone, Mind and Body. It was a spatial class where we lined up in rows and we went down the room in particular movement sequences given by the instructor. The soundtrack was the same every week and the space was a clear, flat, unobtrusive dance studio. The ethos was about not having to be perfect, but to be together, to be in sync with each other. It was amazing. It was super cool. But actually, when I first started, I was so angry with the setup. You see, I'm a partially sighted woman, and learning dance, accessing a dance class, is incredibly difficult because it's taught so visually. And I couldn't see the instructor, so I immediately asked questions of, you know, how was I going to learn this, and what are you doing to include me? So at the first class, the instructor told me, Sarah, go in the third or the fourth row. And I did. But I was like, OK, fine, but can you please verbally describe and instruct me so I can follow the movement. Now, he was intuitive. And he calmly said to me, Sarah, you're not listening. And I got frustrated. And he said again, Sarah, you're not listening. And he had this knowing energy that commanded respect. It was the most profound moment of vulnerability that led to insights and affirmations about myself and the world. My original assumptions about what I needed were challenged. But being in the third and the fourth row meant that I was surrounded by bodies. Everywhere I looked, there was support. I thought it would be unsafe but actually it was the safest place for me to be. Those who went before me led the way, and those beside me supported me, and those behind me pushed me forward. But the deepest lesson for me was that I had a role in offering the same to them. My contribution to the space was equal and valued. And at times, I found myself leading from the center when the others in my row were tired. This was a really new and beautiful collaborative learning experience for me. It was the first time in my life that I felt like I had something to truly offer. My presence and my movement were seen as value-adding. And that was a real shift. This observation, which is <laughs> uncanny, because I'm actually very, very blind, <laughs> it allowed me this time, that, and I took the time, I took, I think it took quite a few years, actually, and I could reflect, and I could get really clear and articulate about what I needed. In that dance class, the design of the room was such that there was no glare in my eyes. And the bare feet on the black floor meant that there was color contrast, which meant that I could follow the steps of the dancers. The music, everyone was following the music in time, which meant that I actually knew where all the bodies were in space. And I knew that through listening and knowing, not by looking. The key thing for me was the close proximity with everybody else. And it was a really simple, structured, and intuitive and flexible exercise. 
my skin became my eyes, and I tapped into this kinesthetic sphere, which made me be able to follow the flow of the movement. It was really, really amazing. And I found that my contribution was possible. And then I was able to kind of, you know, begin to untangle a lifetime of that blame and punishment for my body working the way it did and for me asking for what I needed. Now, if I take this analogy into the workplace, my ideal design for the room in which I work is that there's no glare and that it's quiet so that I can actually use my screen reader on my computer and focus on my work. Then those computer systems and the accessible digital platforms and accessible content and audio description is like that dance that we're learning together. And so, I hold on to the principles of universal design. What I want to see in this world, what I'd really like to see, is that people who design anything, from performances to programs to products, are learning about and talking about who can access them and how. I want to see events where everyone is able to attend and learn and contribute. And I want to see industry. I want to invite industry to our table and follow our conversations about innovation and include people with disability as access consultants from the very start to the very end of the design and the development process. And in that designing for accessibility space, I need to see solutions that focus on fixing our environments first, rather than focusing on fixing our bodily experience of the world. Because while innovation might lead to accessibility, it's actually when we think about accessibility and when we implement accessibility that it always leads to innovation. And in every space, not just tech and design. So, this is not a new idea. But what is new is that we've reached a critical mass. And what really strikes me is that we haven't actually always been good at celebrating those who have gone before. There are hundreds of people from the disability community who have deeply influenced who I am as an advocate, how I create as a performer, and what I want to see in this world. Everyone from historical freak show performers like Cuckoo the Bird Girl, who I do a one-woman show about, to contemporary disabled artists, to managers, to lawyers, to systemic advocates with disability. This is the role of dancers that's in front of me. And I want to thank them. I currently work at the University of Technology, Sydney, on accessibility policy. It's a space where I can contribute and create change from the centre. So I and my row of dancers, my peers, who know our history and our politics, we take the efforts forward. And I hope that you're with us. Because when we know what we all need, then we can lead. Like a wave of dancers down the room. And so, I was never good at speaking up for myself. Before doing that spatial dance class, I had forgotten my value. And the messages in society that I was deviant and deficient were too strong. 
And so for those who come after me, with and without disability, I really want to make sure that we are all concentrating on how we articulate what we need and how we activate it. And especially, you know, if you have an access requirement, especially you. And that could be someone younger than me, or it could be someone older than me who's acquired their disability, or someone coming to terms with invisible disability. And if that is you, welcome to the community. You're one of us. And if that's not you, yet, then believe me, your short-sighted, dodgy need 90-year-old self will thank us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.